Yeah. And anything else to report? I'd love to, uh, I'd love to hear from you. Anything that you, just anything interesting you noticed or anything you tracked, those, the movements that we did were super simple today. And um, I just really wanted to give you that sampling of how you can incorporate mindfulness into really simple movements and, and then use that as a way to track your system and see um, what changes when you turn it. I like, I think of it like turning a little spotlight in to, oh, I don't like that movement or, oh, I really do like that movement. But when you're doing it fast and not in mindfulness, it's a bit harder to uh, get that information so clearly. You're welcome for the options. Yeah. I I did notice it briefly, Jillian, was that the dog? <laughs> I know, they love it. Meanwhile, I could hear Jeffy over in the corner just snoring up a storm. <laughs> I love it. Very different crossing the arm on the head to front circling. Yeah, instead of just the infinity. Isn't that amazing? And you know, that movement, I actually learned that in a pain science workshop. Interestingly, that's one of the ones that they... You know, if you're if you've done the pain informed yoga with me in in the past, that's one of the ones that's really helpful for kicking down the the volume of pain. So because it turns up, so just to really simplify it, when proprioception goes up, and not always, but in a lot of cases, when proprioception goes up, pain nociception goes down. Um, this is kind of based on gait theory, which has a bit of controversy around it. So um, this information may change as they do more research, but that's the idea of it, that when I can't see the, the body part, but I'm doing a movement where I have to kind of track, where is it? Where's the ball so I don't drop it? I'm turning proprioception up. And the theory is that as proprioception goes up, nociception goes down. So if I'm in a lot of pain and I do some really simple little proprioceptive stimulating movements that is going to be helpful for pain levels to drop down. And I find that it's mostly reliable um, depending on the, the client that I'm working with and, and the severity of the pain. It, it, it's, I would say 85% <laughs> of it does decrease pain levels. So um, just in my, you know, just in my experiential in my practice. So it's something to consider if you're working in a population of people that are working with pain. Um, of course, if they've got frozen shoulder or a rotator cuff injury, this one's not the best one, but anything where, you know, like you could just do the something smaller or something a bit uh, more shoulder friendly, but it's really about the tracking. Where is the ball? Um, that's more what the, the point of that exercise is. So I could even just bring it behind me, or I can even have the ball on the floor and I'm rolling it in front of me and then behind me. So it's maybe a little bit more simple, but. All right. In the micro movement to help manage your pain, you find it helpful to think of feet or arms full of pudding. I love that. It has a gentle density that helps than the sharp bone. Oh, that's a beautiful, thank you for that. That's really valuable information. Yeah, so you imagine that your arms or legs are have pudding, like are full of pudding, yeah? Oh, and you're moving it or you're pushing it through kind of? Ah, that's great. What a good one. Awesome, awesome. So great. And it, like to me, you know, my mind goes to like, that would be really great for, for a sort of interoceptive type of, well, I guess a little bit of both, but that like that sense of like, oh, what, what am I feeling in my arms to kind of get that system to wake up? Okay. Well, thank you for all the feedback. How fun to how fun to learn. I I call this the body lab, you know, where we where we use our body as the lab and we go inside and and discover. Anything else that you noticed interesting on that on that level? Experientially, 
would it be useful for you to go to put on um, some nerd science hats and go that direction? <laughs> I know most of you, so I know you're into it. Um, but if you're not, let me know, you know, because um, there's so many different ways to explain this stuff. And I, I want to uh, have it be come through in a way that's useful. Uh, it's from Sally. You felt more space in both nostrils. Oh, that is so cool. Yeah. So from the that little practice, it was like a sense of opening there. I guess um, as far as the science goes, I'll open the slides and and show you. But what I want to just say about that is the reason why I do it this way now, I used to always do it this way. Um, so the old cueing, you know, from 20, 30 years ago was to place your um, middle finger pointer finger on your forehead and you use your thumb and your ring finger as your way of blocking off. And then this way you can kind of, you know, you can put a hand up and, and so that your arm doesn't get tired. And that's still a valid way to do it, by the way. Um, I'm just noticing the chat. Craig says, me too, both space and nostrils, and maybe Luna the dog. <laughs> yeah, I bet. I feel like our dogs get a lot out of, like, you know, mirror neurons. I'm sure they have some too. I don't know. Stephanie, do you know if the dogs have mirror neurons? I have, a, I have a sense they're positively influenced by our yoga practice. Movement equals neuroplasticity. You guessed it. That's what it is. Yeah. So, and, you know, I, I've done a fair bit of research on this topic, and there's a few people that I love to read the findings. Um, one is, her, her name is Adele Diamond. If you're a, a neuroscience geek and you've never heard of her, please check her out. Adele Diamond. And so she's, and, and she works with children, with mind, bringing mindfulness into um, schools and for children with ADHD and, and other attention um, challenges. And it's amazing. But one of the um, newer studies, I think it came out in maybe 2021 or, or 2020, so fairly new, was a basically incorporating movement into what we standardly think of as like, um, what is it? My Mindfulness-based stress re reduction, MBSR. Yes, MBSR. That one's like really, really researched. And there's a lot of really good findings there. Um, and so what where she's bringing it is to do those similar types of explorations. They're often like eight weeks or like they'll have like a control group where somebody's doing cognitive behavioral therapy or something different. And then the groups that are doing like the formal mindfulness practices, and then they explore the, the different findings. And what she did was added in the movement component to it. And it boosted the changes up to like 80% or 85% of improved executive function, which I just got so excited about that. And this was something that wasn't totally new to me. I'm so, by the way, I'll just say I'm not a neuroscientist myself. Um, the 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 neuroscience teacher that comes in and teaches our program is Marjorie Woolacott, and she's been coming in since I think 2016 to teach. As um, she's a neuroscience professor, so I've learned so much from her. And she, one of the very first things I learned from her was this piece in that when they involve movement, the um, the improvements are far greater. So it is, I would say, pretty reliable. Not 100%, of course, nothing ever is in, in the research, but, the, but that is like quite a bit more impactful when there's a movement component incorporated in. So since learning that, I try to keep that in mind, that whenever I'm doing mindfulness, if I'm struggling with it and I'm finding it really hard to kind of kick my brain over and get them, find that muscle, if I can bring in a little bit of movement, it just makes it a little bit, that get that much easier. So for the alternate nostril breathing, which is going to induce mindfulness, um, when you bring the hand up, it's just going to make it that little bit more easy to find and um, boost the benefits. And then I love in the chat, um, movement equals neuroplasticity. Yeah. 
That is uh, something I've come across too. And I would love to hear, like, do you have anything to say about it? If you want to be uh, your voice on the recording, I can even spotlight you if you want your face on the recording, but totally up to you. Uh, no, no, not the face. Okay. Um, <laughs> just the um, voice. Just the voice is fine. Um, I am not remembering the study, but a uh, uh, neuroscience course I took a couple of year, years ago said that all of the educational things we do to learn be, you know, math, science, anything, um, none of the methods can actually be proven scientifically, but movement actually not only can um, contribute in a long lasting way, but um, also uh, possibly increases intelligence, the younger you are and, uh, Yes, and it had to do with mice. So there you go. But <laughs> <laughs> right. And so they were probably like learning a maze or something like that. Yeah. Yeah. Every time the maze yeah. was changed or, you know, yeah. like that, right. they, their um, synaptic circuits, if you will, uh, uh, improved, we'll just say. Oh, just, that's so much yeah. fun. Yeah. 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 But yeah. all the memorization and stuff is very, very much more short term if you're not using it every day, as opposed to, ah. yeah. Yeah, fair enough. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I, I think I've read that too, even in the, you know, in those wonderful studies on the MBS, MBSR, it's like after eight weeks, we can see this and this and this change. But then if the person stops doing it, then those changes sadly go away. So mm -hmm. <laughs> that makes mm -hmm. sense, right? It's like a muscle. Mm -hmm. So if I, I can yeah. see the same thing. I go to the gym and yay, my biceps grew. But if I stop going to the gym. <laughs> yeah, yeah, sure, sure. <laughs> yeah, so you do have to keep, you do have to keep with it. Yeah. Yeah, thank you. Uh, mm -hmm. Can I say your name? I'm, th thank you, kind stranger. <laughs> uh, okay, I am coming to some slides here and, um, we have already gone through this lovely one. So I'm not gonna go, uh, I'll, I'll save the, uh, so, so what I call the, the meat and potatoes neuroscience. Um, what, right now we'll do, we're gonna do the fruit salad neuroscience, okay, today. Uh, I'll save the meat and potatoes neuroscience for the, for the December 10th um, teacher training. However, if you are like, I don't want fruit salad, I want meat and potatoes, just let me know. I can always do a little bit of that for <laughs> you. I just I don't want to bore you at all. So um this is this is from meat. This is this is meat and potatoes. You can see how this could get a little bit um dry and boring. So we're gonna skip some of this. But where here's where I want to go to. I'm gonna start here. If you're new to this term or the concept, the sort of general concept of polyvagal theory, um, this is a term coined by Dr. Stephen Forges. And this is one of the key reasons, this is like my why. This is sort of like why mindfulness in yoga kind of summarized by this concept of neuroception. Um, one of the big benefits I think in yoga classes in particular is the neuroception is this idea that, well, I, it's it, part of polyvagal theory. So it's a theory, um, that the, the nervous system is scanning for cues of safety and cues of threat. So indicators, am I safe? Is this environment safe? or is there danger? And that this scan is happening below the level of conscious awareness, so autonomic nervous system level, all the time that this is the scanning is always happening. And the nervous system is responding to those cues below the level of conscious awareness. So there's this idea in polyvagal theory, and it's called bringing neuroception to perception. And it's this idea that can I bring that forth into conscious awareness. And the benefit in doing that is that then I can get to know my nervous system a little better and have a little bit more ability to modulate my state, my nervous system state. So really good practice to kind of get, get in the hang of doing. 
I will say it doesn't always work because there's a tipping point. So if, um, if my nervous system happens to be tracking a cue of threat, um, even like in, in, in the psychology world, they've called like there's the, the paper tigers and the real tigers or something like that. But there's this idea that my system can be responding to cues of threat or danger that are actually memories that are just the, the, the information is close enough to a memory that that danger might not be there right now, but the system is still responding to it. Um, so just to kind of caveat a little bit that like, you know, sometimes this doesn't always work. And when, when, when our goal is a trauma informed space, I think it's helpful to know that, that we're, we're, we're working to create a safe enough space and don't, like, just to not put too much pressure on yourself. Um, cause if there's been a lot of trauma, um, even in spite of your best efforts that nervous systems can still get really alarmed and uh, and then, you know, you can resource your your students always, but just, just so you know, part, though you can make some really good efforts in creating safe containers. And um, okay, so what I wanna say about this to kind of summarize this slide is that when we bring neuroception to perception, then we we kind of give a, a an overall sense of context so that whatever I'm tracking, I can now locate it as an actual like tangible thing that my conscious mind can 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 look at and evaluate it and say, oh, oh that's the fan, you know, or that's the um, sound of the neighbors next door. They're not coming in the room. So we're, we're sort of identifying a thing um, when we when we can bring it into conscious awareness. So it gives a little bit more space around it. Mindfulness is a key ingredient in being able to do this. Um, one of the exercises I do, and we can do this together right now if you want. Um, one of the exercises I'll do if I'm kind of tracking a need to cultivate more safety in an environment is... I'll invite this little quick exercise where we do, I call it a sweep. So we do a scan of the room with my senses. So I get um, my eyes to look and maybe scan. And what I'm looking for is I'm trying to identify a cue of either something neutral or, or benign or something actually quite um, soothing or satisfying. So what I'll invite, and I'll, I'll let you leave you to just discover it for a moment, is to do a sweep of your room and see if you can land on something that actually has a positive feedback response from your body. Could be like, oh, I really love looking at that color. Or like, I'm really drawn to my fire over there and that the warmth has that uh, feedback from the body. Oh, yeah. So see if you can find something like that. It's like a little resource, a little uh, something good. And then stay with it for about 30 seconds. So either you're gazing at it or if it's a sound, you're just really listening to it. And then you're noticing the impact in your system. How does your system respond to that input? And the idea is we're 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 in we're trying, we're attempting to create a feedback loop where I look at the thing and the thing has a positive response. And so then I want to look at the thing more, and then the response gets louder. And so that's my intention in that practice. That's a great way to start a practice for those of you who are yoga teachers too. Okay, so I'm going to skip over polyvagal here for a moment. There's a slide I'm looking for. If I can hold on. Just zip to it. Um, Also aware of time. Okay, there we go. I just wanted to make sure I 
Got enough time. Okay, what is mindfulness? So these are the two probably most commonly um, accepted definitions of mindfulness. Does anybody have any other ones that you've heard of that you really love as a description, like really descriptive uh, terminology? I really like, um, I really like to say it as mindfulness is paying attention on purpose with openness and compassion. Um, Occasionally, I'll add in internally or externally as terms just to kind of put that context around it that we can be mindful without having to go inside in case sometimes you some days you don't want to go inside. <laughs> so you can still do the practice and you can be mindful of something that's um, at input outside of your body. And that can be good, too. So the. Uh, I can be mindful of my movements, I can be mindful of my sensations of my thoughts so paying attention on purpose i believe uh, that statement comes from uh john kabat i think <laughs> do you know stephanie yeah um i think i've heard it described as um noticing the emotions our brain is um uh cueing us to feel in a given moment oh. and letting that and and you're not really stopping anything. I think it's just a little more specific than what you've written, but the mm -hmm. but um just giving the emotion um the uh, the presence that it's maybe not part of you the way you perceive it to be. Mm -hmm. And the the feeling you have attached to that emotion isn't necessarily uh one that you have to keep is that yeah that's great <laughs> awesome so well said and it's like a really um as you say that what i think of is teasing apart mm -hmm. um you know maybe decoupling even if if, if yeah yeah i would i would agree with that completely yeah yeah wonderful um in the chat, I'm listening to the audio book, The Joy of Movement by Kelly McGonigal. Isn't it? And I, that's like one of my favorite books. I just can't say enough good words about that book. She quotes all the amazing benefits of movement, including research studies. Yeah. Uh, that book, if you like to move and you want to know more about why it's good, <laughs> please, please, please pick up that book. It's so inspiring. Okay, so yeah, and there's other definitions too that you could probably just, you know, at this point, there's so much information available on mindfulness and mindfulness-based stress reduction is probably the one that's got the most research. Um, I know if you're in my program, you know this trick, but if you're new and you're a science nerd, if you go to Google Scholar and you type in any keyword that you want to know if there's research around it or has anybody done studies on this thing. So go open Google Scholar and then you type in your keywords and then you'll find papers and often they're closed. Like if you don't have a number, you can't get to it or you have to pay for it or whatever. But this is something that um, Marjorie, uh, oh no, it was, a, it was a different neuroscience friend of mine. Anyway, it was a, a friend gave me this little hack. And so then what you do is you find a paper that you like, oh, I really would like to read this, is you is you then copy paste the title of the paper into regular Google. And quite often you'll actually find a free version of it somewhere. If not, and you really, really want it and you really don't want to spend $35 on buying it, um, quite often if you email the author, they will send it to you. More often than not, they do. <laughs> they, they want you to. They want you to read it. <laughs> so that's that's just a, a little. If you want to go into that, um, so this is this is based on Marjorie's what Marjorie teaches us in the program. That uh, I think the name of the researcher is Hawks H A W K E S. Uh, 
And I can, I, she gave me a whole bunch of that person's research. So I can just send you those if you want them. Um, but this is really interesting where what they were comparing was aerobic exercise, mindfulness alone, like mindful MESR, so just seated mindful meditation, and then mindfulness-based movement. And it was the mindfulness-based movement that showed the most improvement in executive function. So that's kind of fun. She talks in more detail about, you know, what they were, you know, how they came to these conclusions and what they were studying. But it was really, it's really neat to me to see that um, mindfulness-based movement, like, because we know aerobic exercise is really good for the brain. We've known that for a long time. But to say that, like, Tai Chi is just as good and in some cases more, that's really cool because it's not aerobic. <laughs> so that's fun. Um, we'll cover this a little more extensively in the in the module nine, mod, like in the neuroscience module. But the, just to really say that this is from Dan Siegel's work and this idea of how like how change takes place in these stages through mindfulness. I think it's it's just helpful to name. I'll really quickly talk about it. The, the first state is this idea of learning a new skill. So like something you've never done before, just even that, like that stage one is really in and of itself really valuable. And especially if you can lock into it with a little bit of mindfulness. So if I can go um, into recognition, oh, I've never done that before. Like, oh, like, oh, I, can I do it? I don't, oh, oh, look, I can do it. oh, I've never done that before. So that's like, like, that's like stage one of the, of that introduction to new skill. And then the next stage is I practice it. So the, the through repetition, I get better and better at it. And this is kind of like the neural, neuroplasticity uh, goal. <laughs> These four stages. And anything you would add to that in your journeys, Stephanie? Anything that you've learned in the uh, stages of change or neuroplasticity? Um, honestly, I had just written when you were we were talking about um, emotions and healing. Um, mm. Change is something that I think in a state of trauma, your body is constantly reacting to as if it's going to be negative. Yeah. And so once um, you can kind of uh, perceive that uh, experience, I think the, the change that you were addressing in the positive form, mm -hmm. there's a huge interaction with like we, we can all remember as kids, oh my gosh, I was in school. I was so stressed out. I couldn't even remember what I did know. If you think about those moments and how yeah. um, you were sitting frozen with that, that fear or that anxiety that the change, we mm -hmm. always perceive change as bad in mm -hmm. some, there, there, there's a tendency, let's just say that. So being able to do like what you're saying and see it as the positive and um yeah. an ability to um you know improve your mind and um continue to um grow um neurologically is you know really beautiful oh thank you yeah that's mm -hmm. it's, uh, it's important to point that out too like that it um change is hard <laughs> and it like it, it burns a lot of calories too like the the brain um Mm -hmm. the brain might not want to devote <laughs> yeah <laughs> all that energy to change so it's got to be worthwhile and I think there's a there's something to be said for if, if the environment feels safe enough and there's like a like a kind of feel-good feeling it's like what Kelly McGonigal talks about as well that the, it's like oh okay okay I'll do it <laughs> Uh, in the chat, my sister and I were just talking about the frozen state of fear and the change and not being able to learn. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I think it is important to name that, you know, like um, like the motivation needs to be there for for the brain to be willing to devote those calories to <laughs> because a lot there's a lot happening uh, when we talk about change, you know, on the surface, it can seem really simple, but it's um 
there, there's a lot, there's a lot going on there. So one of them, paying attention. So this is a quote from Dr. Sam Siegel. So his, his field of study, by the way, is called interpersonal neurobiology. And um, I really love it because I think when we look at um, learning about the brain in the context of what I want to use it for, I think his work can be as far as what, what what do we want to use it for well most of us are here because we love yoga <laughs> and we want to use this information for maybe how to be better yoga teachers or facilitate some kind of um, empowering environment so that people can experience positive change and i think his work kind of gives a lot of context for that that interpersonal neurobiology so it's like how does this work on the level of relationshiping um, whether that's I'm a teacher and and we're relationshiping together in this context, or even your personal relationships, like your you know parent child or friendships or spousal. So anyway, check him out. That's my little plug for Dan Siegel. I love him. <laughs> so this is a quote by him: "Where attention goes, neural firing flows, and neural connection grows." I've also heard him say it as where attention goes, myelin grows specifically. So myelin being the, um, the little nerve anatomy lesson, myelin being the fatty sheath like surrounding the nerve and the fatty sheath allows for the, um, the, connect, the communication to go through faster. And there's also, I, I can't remember the term of it. Um, Stephanie, feel free to put this one in the chat if I can't think of it. But that that period of like the down, right? Like there's like the rest and then it before it can fire again, there's a term for that. Um, so, but that is also quicker. So that when there's more myelin, so we can do repeat things faster and communicate faster when there's more myelin. So it just allows for a stronger connection. Um, our brain doesn't care, just reading the chat, our brain doesn't care what we want, it just wants us to survive. And it's just guessing how to make that continue, yeah. Our brains are like these prediction machines, not machines, sorry, jo I just heard Joanne tell me to not say machine. <laughs> I thought Joanne was gonna be here today. Oh, she'll, she'll, she'll come to the next one, probably. Okay, so does that make sense? Um, what I wanna say about the attention piece too is, and it was really an area I wanted to focus on today, that, that this idea of like mindfulness as paying attention on purpose, as a practice. So the more that I do that as a practice, the more that I start to see that I have um, choice in what I pay attention to. Now, there's a lot of things that need to take place for me to be in a state of choice at all. Um, just on a poly, just from the polyvagal lens, like if my system is detecting a lot of threat, you know, like Joanne talks about how there's a hierarchy within the heteriarchy within the body, within the system, this is where that hierarchy piece kind of comes in. So if I detect threat, the system is going to put that as a priority over getting creative and um, writing a poem. Because my, you know, rerouting all the energy required to get me to safety is more important than sitting down and reflecting on a poem. So... This is the this is the hierarchy there, resting potential. Thank you. Um, I can't remember where I was going with that. Um, hopefully it'll come back. My my resting potential is slow. <laughs> um, yeah. So paying attention is the thing is I, I think mainly what I where I was taking this was that when you can kind of recognize when I'm safe enough and I can recognize and kind of become conscious of in this moment, I have choice over where I'm going to direct the focus of my attention. 
And then I do that on purpose. And then that becomes a practice. Then it's like this, what he's saying. I'm, it's literally like I'm strengthening a muscle. I'm getting better and better and better because there's more and more uh, energy and attention and, and myelin going to the, those parts of the brain. So in the previous slide, there was that statement, um, well, fires together, wires together, which I think if we're, we've studied anything about the brain, we've heard that one often attributed to Donald Hebb, but it was actually Carla Schatz that said it um, just because I always have to put that little nugget in because she's a woman and I want her recognized. Carla Schatz, Carla Schatz. Okay. Anyway, so it was the one that said what fires together, wires together. <laughs> so that's, that's, a, that's just a concept though. But when we look at this experientially, when, this is the key. When I can make note and put my attention to, in this moment, I'm safe enough. Maybe I'll take that in a little bit, really let my nervous system know in this moment, just, just here and now, it's safe enough. All my needs are met. There's four walls around me. And I, in this moment, even if it's on a micro scale, I can choose where to direct the focus of my attention. Oh, what would I want to put my attention on? Where do I want to grow um, my, my brain to kind of default to more, more simply or more easily? Often I'll ask it in this way, which is in this moment, what do you want to feel? Like just in this moment, just right now, what would be good? What would be nourishing or true in this moment? So when I ask that question to myself, it changes that like the answer that bubbles up is often different. You know, in every moment I'll get something a little bit different, but often it'll be something along the lines of um, peaceful, content. If I'm maybe in a bit of more of an upstate, it might be something like joy or, or fun or playful. If I'm in a more relaxed state, it might be something more like <clears throat> soothe, that kind of thing. So I'm gonna stop the share for a minute and I'm gonna invite that we do a little, a little exploration together. If you've already gotten your word just in me talking about it a little bit, you can go with that. But if not, let's explore. <clears throat> so let's return to the breath just for a moment here. And why don't we put a little bit of what we talked about into practice? So as we've already done once, maybe we can quickly scan, scan the room and incorporate that in. Is there a little um, bit of information or input around you? That has, a, has an impact in your system that you like to feel. Can you give yourself permission to take it in for another 30 seconds? I think it is like steeping in it. And that whatever that feeling is <clears throat> that you're most attracted to, that might be the one you go with. But let's go one step further into some breath awareness. Just turning your attention to how it is to breathe in. Just notice what it's like to breathe out. Eyes can be opened or closed.
just on this front of you can choose where to direct the focus of your attention. See, as you inhale, what do you want to pay attention to? What is it about inhaling that you enjoy the most? Maybe on a really subtle level, you notice maybe it's something global, like every time I inhale, I feel just a little bit more alive. Every time I inhale, I notice it's open and free or nourishing, maybe. I'll just give you maybe 30 seconds or a little bit more to explore, just sandbox this on your own. So every time you inhale, what you enjoy the most about it. You can pare that down to one word. This is going to become your mantra in a moment. Yeah. Once you've got that word, we're going to go to exhale. It's very, uh, someone in the chat said they just noticed that exhale is more enjoyable now than the inhale was earlier. So that's amazing notings. So as you exhale, what is it about the exhale you enjoy just in this moment? What is something good or, or true for you? Just in this moment. About exhaling. And again, see, can you pare that down to one word? Typically, your inhale word and your exhale word will be different because they are slightly different uh, impacts on the system, but they might be the same. So the next step that we would go from here is to now use this as a mantra. So every time you inhale, you say your inhale word. And then every time you exhale, you say your exhale word. And this can really allow so that now we can really direct attention to that specific quality. And as we pay attention to it, maybe it gets a little more obvious. Just really let your experience be yours. So just whatever is true for you in this moment. Inhaling your inhale word, exhale. Say your exhale word. I'll do it about 10 times. And, you know, as we named earlier in the session, sometimes mindfulness is hard. Sometimes it's hard to pay attention or direct attention. So if that's one of those moments right now, I find that just, you know, adding in the ingredient of compassion 
self-compassion in particular. So just, you know, really let yourself off the hook. It's okay to be kind to yourself. can let that go just releasing all effort to maybe go go a little bit global with your awareness and get a sense of like yeah how is it now Yeah, and come back to the screen. I'm kind of feeling like maybe our brains have worked really hard and they're probably tired. <laughs> so I'll maybe open it up now for Q&A or discussion or just anything anybody wants to share uh, about the, well, the practices we did, any of the information that was, um, kind of surrounding those practices, if you have anything that you want me to clarify, or just anything to report from your from your body lab. Yeah, Stephanie, are you, I don't remember if you were unmuted before, did you unmute just now to share? Um, I just felt uh, more of a sense of integration after, mm -hmm. and that is healing. And I think healing's part of compassion for yourself, maybe. That's such a lovely insight. Yeah. I hope everyone had some healing and, and experienced that compassion. Oh, yeah. Thank you. Um, you just reminded me of something I've been trying to get myself more and more into the habit of, which is um, to dedicate the fruits of my practice to the benefit of others. So if you want to join me on that. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I and may that that be your fruit as well in return. Oh, uh, yeah. Circle. Uh, like a loop. Mm -hmm. I love mm -hmm. that. Yeah. What we exhale, we inhale and so forth. Yeah. Yeah. I love it. That tunglein practice. Um, yeah, so I usually would just say it's something like, um, may the fruits of my practice today be dedicated to the benefit of just anyone who needs it right now. I usually just kind of channel whatever. Sometimes I'll say like the alleviation of suffering of others, or sometimes I'll just say for the general benefit of others. So, let you tune in and see what 